Welcome back, fight fans. We are here yet again for another episode of Shooting the Shit Podcast here on the Loudmouth MMA Podcast Network, as well as Combat Press and everywhere where this show is simulcast. I am your host, Riley Contech, back with another fantastic episode this week. Uh, before we get to our guest of the day, uh, obviously want to remind everybody, especially our fans in Illinois, uh, to head on to Facebook.com for uh, Cornelius and Sons. If you have any home construction, home improvement needs uh, this winter, uh, again, head there. Schedule an appointment with Raul. Again, that is Cornelius and Sons on Facebook.com. So with that, let's head to our guest for the day today. Uh, he is a coach and fitness expert. Uh, he is the three-time award-winning trainer of the year. He's a sports performance coach, and he works with uh, numerous UFC fighters. We have Phil Daru today. Phil, how are you to say, sir? I'm good, man. Thanks for having me on. No problem. Thanks for coming. Now, um, obviously, you know, you work in fitness. Uh, there's a big discrepancy, you know, p- you know, people maybe not knowing how to mix the fitness in with the fighting and the, and the lifting, you know. Uh, so, I mean, when you're working with UFC fighters and mixed martial artists, you know, how do you mix the two together to give them peak performance without them injuring themselves? I know the, the big thing is, is, you know, can you do power lifting and also do martial arts? Yeah, we. I mean, we definitely don't power lift with them. Um, my main concern is to make sure that we're giving them the opportunities to get better from a physical preparation standpoint, but also mitigate fatigue. So we do that by understanding the schedule and understanding the athlete. So first and foremost, before any athlete starts with me, I make sure that we have an assessment protocol that we utilize that can help me identify what they actually need from a weakness standpoint. Then from there, I can program accordingly. But the main thing when it goes when you go into a fight camp is to understand what they need to do on a daily basis, because, again, they are training multiple times throughout the days and weeks. So the main focus for me is, again, giving them the proper stimulus of either strength, power, speed, whatever the case may be. And then from there, I can adequately put together a program that is going to enhance the qualities for them as an individual, um, not just for a specific a position or specific game plan, but also just to make sure that they're better moving humans. And then from there, that's going to transfer over as the fight gets closer. But obviously, our main concern and the main purpose of what we're doing inside the fight camp is going to be more so predicated towards the skills training. So I have to make sure that that's our main priority. And then from there, I can utilize things like like powerlifting exercises or whatever exercise that you want to utilize um, to enhance the qualities necessary from a physical prep standpoint. For sure. Now, I mean, obviously you deal with fighters of different sizes. You know, I know you've you've told me you work with guys like Greg Hardy, who we'll talk about later, who's, you know, as heavyweight as a heavyweight can get. Uh, And I'm Mm -hmm. sure you work with guys that are smaller. Are the, are the, the plans that you implement different based on their size and weight class? It can be, yeah. Um, it, it also depends on their game plan and how you know how they like to move inside the cage. Whether they're you know highly active or if they are more of a you know a slow, steady pace guy. I want to make sure that we're giving them the opportunity from again from a physical standpoint that can enhance the qualities of a of a fighter that they are. So they say, let's say for instance, I've been working with Junior Dos Santos for about four years, right? I know that he has a good amount of output. He's highly athletic from for his stature, I believe that he is one of the biggest and most athletic human beings that I've had. Um, I've also worked with Walt Harris, who's another really athletic individual. But if you look at a guy like Greg Hardy, who's played in the NFL, um, is one of the most athletic individuals pound for pound that I've ever had. So that is going to dictate on how I actually train him. And then I'm going to see exactly what he needs outside of the weight room, whether it be mobility work, whether it be, you know, more conditioning. And that's something that we've been working on based upon his specific weaknesses. Now, if I have a, a, let's say a smaller guy or let's say a female, I know that the outputs are going to be way higher where the, where the goal for us is to make sure that they are ready for whatever stresses are going to be put upon them inside the cage. So again, we're going to be working on more of that lactic conditioning or more of that higher volume outputs because I want them to be able to cope with those stresses and then enhance the quality of their outputs when they when the time comes. For sure. Now, in terms of doing what you do, because obviously you're very good at what you do, uh, what was what was your formal background? Did you go to university for this, or was this something that you had developed, you know, without having to do uh, do schooling? 
Um, I believe, well, first I did my undergrad in exercise science at Alabama State University. I played college football there. Um, and then I went and, and uh, right into MMA. So I turned pro at the age of 21. So I've had about eight years as a professional fighter and about two years as, a, as an amateur. Started with Dean Thomas um, at American Top Team. And um, learning, learning the sport in general and being able to actually do it and compete in it um, at the professional level, I got to understand not only from a science perspective, having a background in exercise science, I understood the biomechanics, I understood the physiology, so I just mended the two together based off experience and practical knowledge of science and other, and other forms of exercise um, to initiate a better response, right? We got guys that are very good academically, um, have PhDs and, and they have you know degrees beyond belief and they have a bunch of certifications behind their name, um, but they have, also have to know the sport. They also have to know the individual and that's where you coming in and, and if you are a coach looking to enhance your knowledge base on a particular sport with a particular athlete, I do believe you need to make sure you spend some time in that sport, you know, and, and again, you don't have to fight, but you still need to train in those particular arts so that you can understand what the athlete is going through. Right. And, and, and I think that's a really good point. I, I think that uh, I would, even if he's not an exercise, you know, science major, I trust my coach on anything having to do with that, even if he doesn't have a formal background, as opposed to the kid mm -hmm. in the basement who types on his computer. I definitely agree with you there. Um, yeah. Now, you know, for, to kind of get over from the fighting aspect to, you know, just the physical fitness aspect, you know, a lot of people that watch the show are fans of the sport, but they're not exactly mm -hmm. in the sport themselves. So, uh, maybe some tips and stuff when it comes to working out in the gym. Now we'll start off with a fun question. Um, what are your biggest pet peeves when you go to the gym? Because one of the most annoying places I go is the gym, not for the aspect of having to work out, but because most other people that go there annoy me. What are your biggest pet peeves? Well, I mean, fortunately I've been able to own my own facility since I was young, so I didn't have to really deal with that anymore. But when I do go there, I would say that my, my main thing is, there's a couple of things, actually. Actually, there's a few things. But the main thing would be not being serious and, and, and paying too much attention to the the phone or talking to their training partners and not really getting in there and getting after it the way they should be. And that's an issue right there. I, I think that if you're going to do something, if you're going to go into the gym and actually train, not just work out, there's a difference. Um, it, you have to have a focus and you have to have a strategy. And if that focus is skewed in other directions, then I don't care what type of strategy you try to have. It's not going to go ahead and it's not going to be uh, beneficial for you. So that's one thing. And then and obviously not re-racking the weights oh. if I'm trying to come around or putting together too many circuits or stations or whatever <laughs> the fuck. That's, that's, that also kills me. So. Let's yeah, see. I think you touched on my big three, so that's that's fantastic. Uh, yeah, like you were saying, like I mean, we can't even take an hour, hour and a half out of our days without our phones. Uh, I think that the policy sh at the gym should be if it's not on like an armband or like in a thing because you're listening to music, I think the phone should be checked at the door. That's just my yeah. opinion. But yeah, re, -wet, re rack in the weights is always a big one, especially at a you know, at a larger gym like the one I go to. Uh, yeah, definitely. So <laughs> at least you have your own place to go to. I'm sure you don't have to deal with that as much. Uh, yeah. Now. Uh, in terms of weight training, exercise, et cetera, you know, a lot of people I know uh, into the whole exercise thing, but, uh, you know, a lot of my friends, you know, they hit a specific point where, you know, you know, they plateau in terms of what they can lift or what they can, if they can power lift, you know, um, why do you think that is for so many people and what can they change to try and get over those plateaus? For the most part, it's, it's probably going to be switching up the exercise selection, um, switching up the variances, whether it be, again, like I said, exercise, tempos, durations. Um, you should always come up with a, a solid program that leads for a particular amount of time. And then from there, you can go ahead and structure out what your next goal is, whether it be building strength, whether it be building power, conditioning, so on and so forth. So as opposed to somebody just kind of going in there and just basically winging it, we want to make sure that we have a set progression and that's going to help you um, maintain your progressions. And also, again, like I talked about before is mitigate fatigue. So having a solid plan of action and making sure that you have a goal, whether it be four, six, eight, 12 weeks long, that should predicate what you're going to be doing. And also you should see a linear progression going further. Now, nothing in life is truly linear. You're going to have some increases, but you're going to also have some peaks and valleys and dips. 
And so you got to make sure that you understand that and you should plan accordingly. So you should plan out a, a solid deload week of what we call it, where basically you're bringing down volume and you're bringing down intensity a slight bit. But what the goal there is, is what we call super compensation, basically meaning is that you're going to get the adaptations that you've been looking for after you let your body recover from the stimuluses that you've been trying to attain in the past training. So if you let your body recover enough, you'll get a spike in your energy and you'll get a spike in the ability to produce whatever you're trying to do. So I usually like to do a three week up, one week down, and that's primarily what you would see in a proper periodization protocol. So you would go three weeks up, whether it be build up to intensity or build up volume, and then you would deload down. Now, if you're just a regular gym goer or somebody who's just trying to get in shape, build some lean tissue, probably burn some body fat, you definitely want to vary your exercises, but you don't want to vary it too much to where your body doesn't understand what it's going through and you're always constantly sore. Now, soreness doesn't equate to growth in a lot of ways. It just means that you weren't ready for that stimulus. Mm -hmm. So we want to slowly progress and then you want to vary it when the time comes. Yeah, I think that's really good advice too. And, and the, you know, especially the sore thing. And I've said that to people before, you know, that just because you're sore doesn't mean you got a good lift. It could mean something else. You're doing it wrong or your, or your muscles aren't rested enough for the lift you're doing that day. So, yeah, I think that's good advice too. Now, um, in terms of weight training uh, with cardio, because you, you hear the old adage that cardio kills muscle. And you know, I think a lot of the Jersey Shore guys kind of uh, really spread that rumor around when, the, when that show was popular. So what's the right amount of cardio to do if you're trying to put on muscle and build muscle? Uh, well, if you're trying to build muscle, limiting your steady state or low intensity cardio is going to be a little bit more advantageous for you, um, especially because when you're working on fast switch fibers, when you're working on the ability to produce force, um, you really don't want to stimulate too much slow twitch unless you're trying to do some more higher rep ranges and try to do some conditioning through uh, what we call lactic capacity training, where you're basically working through massive amount of reps. And that's primarily for a conditioning factor, more for muscular endurance. But if your goal is to work on true hypertrophy, then you still want to have some type of caloric uh, surplus. So you don't want to expel too much calories. And if you do that with obviously something like cardio, it's going to be very hard for your body to actually produce or to build muscle in that particular manner. So what I would do, however, is do some type of metabolic training where you're actually doing some high intensity intervals, which is going to enhance your growth hormone. It's gonna enhance all the qualities that is gonna help you build muscle. Um, and it's also gonna burn a little bit of body fat too as well. Not saying totally get rid of the, the slow steady state cardio. I definitely think that it's, it's beneficial, one for appetite, um, especially if you're trying to build muscle, you're gonna to need to build your appetite, but, uh, but I wouldn't do it all the time. I would probably minimize it to maybe one to two times per week if you're trying to build muscle only. For sure. And we'll talk about diet in a second. I just had one more question before we get to the diet. Uh, what are your thoughts on high rep lifting versus low rep lifting? So there's people that do the row, you know, most of the sets they do is higher weight with low reps. And there's other people that, you know, do the opposite where they do, you know, lo uh, lower amount of weight, but higher reps. What do you think yeah. between the two? Um, you know, studies are conflicting in a ways when it comes to hypertrophy training. There's a lot of good guys out there. Um, Schoenfeld be, being one of them. Um, Eric Helms being another um, where they actually study these things. And for me, you know, that's not a, that's not a main concern for myself, especially for the athletes I work with. Actually, we're trying to not to, not to build muscle because it's a weight class sport. Right. Um, but when it comes down to it, as, as far as building maximal hypertrophy, it really depends on the person and what they can adhere to. Um, I know a lot of guys that can build muscle on higher rep ranges. We're talking for hypertrophy, we're talking maybe 10 to 12 reps. And then the lower end would be more like five to six, you know, five's kind of cutting it pretty close, but six to eight, maybe in that, in that range there. And that's con considered low rep in hypertrophy or in bodybuilding uh, terms, right? When you're talking about maximal power and strength, those are actually high reps but you just got to know what you're trying to accomplish. Now, can you mix it up? Yeah, sure. I like to do a compound lift, whatever it be, whether it be a squat, bench, deadlift, something that's going to use multiple muscles. Mm -hmm. And then that would be more on my lower volume 
But again, I'm still working on maximizing hypertrophy with those higher threshold motor units. So again, those fast switch fibers. And again, I'm, I'm utilizing all those motor units recruited at once because it is a compound lift. So I'll do something like a bench press or a squat, and that could be somewhere around the five, six to eight rep range. And then from there, you do what's called accessory work, where we're trying to build the muscles that surround that, but in isolated fashion. And that can be done in 10 to 12 rep ranges. Right. Okay. Yeah. And that, and that's definitely sounds more familiar for a person like me. Um, mm-hmm. So that's, you know, that sounds, you know, good. So uh, now the diet, you know, for w- let's talk about two different types of diets that you would recommend or what would you mm-hmm. do or stay away from. Now, if you're a person that's, you know, We'll, we'll talk about just stay with the, the weightlifting part first. If you're a person trying to build muscle, I mean, obviously you always hear you need protein, protein, protein. Yep. As a person who's building muscle, what are the things you want to move towards and what are the things you want to stay away from? And then I'll follow that up with uh, your MMA clientele. I mean, I would say that when it's come to, to building muscle, you definitely need protein. Protein is going to help with protein synthesis. It's going to help with protein or muscle breakdown and or at least reducing muscle breakdown to a degree we're trying to enhance the recoverability there so having amino acids put in you know directly and also making sure that you are you have an adequate amount of calories which is going to be either in a surplus or at least in a maintenance you have to know your basal metabolic rate you have to know your resting um, caloric intake that you need to have just to survive and then from there you can have a slight increase the goal really is to you know maximize muscle hypertrophy but also minimize fat gain so if that's what you're trying to do like what we call body recomp which is trying to minimize as much fat gain in a caloric surplus so you do want to have higher amounts of protein but you also want to have some carbohydrates one to fuel your your training sessions um and also to spare breakdown of that muscle so that will definitely help um fats are good honestly more for the hormonal side if you bring down fats dramatically, then you're going to have a negative effect on your energy levels and on your hormones. So that has to be put into play. But when you when it comes down to like a standard, you know, they, they usually say like one gram per pound of body weight is a sweet spot. Um, I've been seeing studies that now uh, state that you should be doing, especially on a, on a recomp, you should be doing somewhere around 1.3 to 1.4 uh, grams per pound of lean body mass, which is not, not your total body weight, but you know, obviously your lean, lean tissue. So for me, I just actually got a DEXA scan done today and my lean body mass, you're looking at about uh, 178 where I'm um, 202 pounds right now. So I'm sitting around, uh, 12 to 14 percent of body fat. Now that's done on a DEXA scan, which is kind of like the gold standard other than hydrostatic weighing. Um, so that's actually measuring out visceral and subcutaneous fat. So that that's everything in there. So if I were to do like a three pinch or a seven pinch, I'd probably come out at like 10 to maybe even 11% body fat. But so the goal for me right now is I still want to burn some body fat. So I'm going to be in a caloric deficit enough to where I'm still maintaining muscle or maybe even building some muscle in that perspective, but I'm going to do it very slowly. And I know a lot of people say you can't build muscle on a caloric deficit, but if you keep your proteins high enough, um, at least you'll be able to spare what you have. And that's, and that's really the goal is to, is to minimize body fat reduction or minimize body fat and reduce it to a degree of where you feel comfortable, but still be able to produce energy in the gym. Right, right. So now instead of somebody who's trying to build muscle, like you said, MMA fighters have a weight deadline, so they're probably not trying to build as much. What do you suggest to them uh, in maintaining or, you know, after they go through your regimen, what's the diet looking mm-hmm. like for them? Well, they're definitely going to need some carbohydrates after the training session. It's 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 a log it's a large amount of volume, especially off camp. You know, they're going to need that for recovery. They're going to need it for rebuilding. Um, when you're t- when you're talking about protein, so uh, again, our primary focus is going to be getting in the adequate amount of protein that they need, and then carbohydrates, fats. We usually uh, put that away from the training times, or at least after training because again i don't want to slow the digestive process of protein and carbohydrates i want that to get right into the muscle into the nutrients or bring the nutrients into the tissues that need it so for me um fats are going to be done in the mornings primarily um that's going to give them more neural drive it's going to help with cognitive functioning um it's going to give them more resting energy and then and then they'll have some some carbohydrate carbohydrates spread out throughout the day because they are training multiple times throughout the day so it really just depends on the training session um, if the training session is just drilling, then 
then we can probably do some more fats and protein and a little bit of carbohydrates because again they're not they're not expelling too much energy there they're not losing any glycogen um, to that degree now if they're doing something as far as you know high volume sets in in an off cam program where they're going to be doing more of uh, those higher volumes then yeah i'll go ahead and throw some more carbohydrates in now getting closer to the fight and then when they start doing their weight cuts that's when we have to slowly bring down the calories yep. And then you manipulate the carbs based upon their training times. For sure. Yeah, and, and obviously I've talked to nutritionists before who work with MMA fighters. It seems like a sweet science. So I'm sure there's a lot, yeah. of, uh, a lot of thought and planning that goes into that. Um, yeah. Now we will jump to the UFC card that's going to be happening this weekend. It is the – we take this a week in advance, so it will be the other one. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, I will advise the fans that this happens often, that, you know, this card could change by the time this episode comes up, as we've seen the last couple weeks. Um, but, Phil, we've got, a, we've got a card live from Vegas. It's the last card of the year. Uh, it is UFC mm -hmm. Fight Night. The headliner will be Stephen Thompson versus Jeff Neal. Now, before we get to that fight, you have a couple of fighters on the card, as you mentioned to me before taping. Um, why don't we just mm -hmm. talk about them really quickly, and you can, you know, tell me what they need to do to win their fights. You can give me a background, whatever, and then we'll talk about that main event. So, first off, headlining the prelim card, you have Bilal Muhammad, who you work with. He's taking mm -hmm. on Diego Lima. So, why don't you just uh, give me a little bit on, on Bilal and what he has to do here? I mean, I think Bilal just needs to be assertive. He needs to push the pace on Diego. I know that um, I used to be a part of American Top Team for a while, and and I know Diego. Um, I know Diego's training partners. You know, Diego's a really good athlete, obviously, really good fighter. Um, but I think that if he, if Bilal can push the pace on him and and set set his goals of where he needs to, maybe you know, obviously threaten the takedown a couple of times, and and then yeah, watch out for the leg kicks and watch out for anything that's that from a straight striking distance he can close the gap and then he can make it happen from there but i think more so just making sure that he's dominant as far as pushing the pace and managing his outputs is going to be good is uh is Bilal as goofy in the gym as he is on twitter nah he's he's actually a good guy he's actually when he came down to florida because i trained him remotely uh, when he came down to florida um him and jared gordon are really close and i trained jared too as well uh, but yeah, he's 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 cool. Like he was he was quiet in the beginning, and then he kind of opened up. But he's definitely a funny guy. I see him on Twitter going crazy sometimes. Yeah, he's uh he's he's looking for that Twitter award. I think if the UFC still even gives that out. But uh, <laughs> uh interesting fight. He's actually from my neck of the woods. He's from Chicago, so uh, yeah. that's how we know him. Um, now the other guy you said you work with on this card, and I mean, from an all all around sports name, he's probably the biggest name on the card. Just for you know the casual sports fan, if you're a UFC fan, he's not obviously. Yeah. Uh, but Greg Hardy, he's taken on Marcin Tybura. Um, so again, same thing with Bilal. You know, comment on Greg. What do you see going on in this fight? How does he win? Give me the whole uh, nine yards. I mean, Greg just has to control his outputs in a way where he's not putting himself in a bad position. I think that that's one thing. Greg is a super athlete. Um, he still needs work technically. Um, but when it comes down to hard determination, dedication, the kid has it. He's still, you know, obviously you've seen it with the amount of success he's had in the other sports. Um, he also plays basketball at a high level too as well. He's still dunking a basketball at the at the height and weight that he's, that he's at. So, I mean, he's an all-around athlete. So I think if he can put it together and not – and not let his emotions get to him, he'll be all right. And that's that's primarily every fight that he has, really. It's, you know, for this one, he's he's obviously going to be the better athlete. Um, he's going to be faster. He's going to be more explosive. So you just got to make sure that he can technically work his game plan and, and stay in a strategic approach, where as opposed to just trying to go out there and um, and lay hands on the guy without any real understanding of, of placement and precision. Yeah, I think that's a pretty good assessment. I mean, he's had looks like it was it seven, six or seven fights in the UFC. One of his losses was a DQ, which he clearly mm -hmm. won that fight. One was a no contest for using an inhaler. He won that fight. I mean, I think he's greatly gone past the expectations of most people who saw him coming into this sport as this football player with a weird criminal background. They call yeah. it a criminal background. I think the charges were dismissed. You know, MMA yeah. journalists just like to shit on anybody they can, which is why nobody likes them. Um, but, I mean, <laughs> his most recent fight, he knocked out a kickboxer. So, I mean, he's clearly, yeah. he's clearly got what it takes. Oh, yeah, definitely, definitely. I think, I think he could take it to the next level, I mean, as far as, you know, climbing up the ranks. And, again, it's just going to come down to him honing in on his technical efficiency, honing in on his skill set. That takes time, you know. He's, if you really think about it, he really hasn't 
he's only been training in the sport for maybe four years. I remember when he walked in the gym. So, I mean, four years have gone by um, and he skyrocketed. I think that the one thing also is that he's, he's super ambitious. So, you know, making sure that he can hone in his focus points on, on one particular task as opposed to 10 different things, it's going to help him out in the long run. For sure. And then we'll get to the main event. But before we get to that, I mean, this card is absolutely stacked. I mean, this is bigger than some of the pay-per-view cards they've had this year, and it's on free TV. You know, you got you got Anthony Pettis. You got Jose Aldo. You've got Marlon Moraes, you know. Yeah. Um, and, again, we said Greg Hardy. You know, these are big names. Um, you know, looking into 2021, I mean, with, you know, the UFC not having crowds for most of the year, uh, you know, and, you know, maybe it not being as much on, on, um, what do you call it? Attendance, you know, live gate. Do you think they start to move to a thing where they start to put better cards on free TV? Cause they don't have to rely as much on the live attendance and they pay-per-view. Yeah. They don't have to make as stacked because people are going to be buying those. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I like that. I think that that would be something that they may go into, especially if this thing drags out for any time longer. Um, who knows? But I think it would be good for the for the under, more the undercard guys, um, the the guys that are on the come up. You know, I got guys like, uh, you know, like Randy Costa, you know, and, and Jared Gordon that that are looking for that that ability or that experience that they can get from you know this this thing happening. So hopefully it'll happen um, and it'll keep happening. But who knows what happens with with what's going on in this crazy world nowadays. That's true. And Randy Costa, who has been on this show, admitted he drinks, uh, was it truly or White Claw, which we busted his balls for. So uh, <laughs> probably good for the carb intake. But all right, yeah. so for the main event, we have uh, – the main event was originally – God, I'm, I should know this off the top of my head, but it was originally Kamzat Chimaya versus Leon Edwards. Uh, instead, mm -hmm. we will get Stephen Thompson versus Jeff Neal. So – um, you know, I love this fight, uh, Thompson versus Neil. I think it's it's a really mm -hmm. interesting matchup. You have two big time mm -hmm. strikers. Uh, so, what do you see in this fight? And obviously, you don't have a fighter uh, either mm -hmm. way, so you can be a little bit more uh, impartial down the middle here. Uh, and how does yeah. this fight go? I don't know. I, I have to see more on Jeff Neil, but I I mean, Stephen Thompson is obviously one of the most talented strikers we have in the UFC, and from what he's accomplished so far um, in in fighting for the title and this night, it's hard to bet against him if I were to put my money on it, you know. Uh, I think that, especially with the karate style, he can blade himself accordingly, get in and out, uh, get himself out of, he doesn't really take as much damage unless he, like, gets into a firefight. So, with that, I think that he can, you know, for what he has as far as experience goes and his ability to get in and out of the pocket, he should, uh, he should pick him apart. I don't foresee an, a, a, a total, like, TKO or KO, but I do see him picking them apart and, and edging him out in the victory. Yeah, definitely that karate, that point-fighting karate style definitely makes him harder to hit unless, like you said, yeah. he gets careless, uh, but we don't see that very often. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, now you mentioned Neil. You don't know as much about him, uh, and I, I think you wouldn't be the only one. I mean, a lot of people, and this guy hasn't fought in over, and by the time he steps in the cage, it'll be over a year since he fought, um, mm -hmm. but this guy's a big-time striker, one-punch knockout power. And in, in the UFC so far, he's five, he's five and zero. Oh. He has two head kick knockouts, including one over mm -hmm. Mike Perry, uh, and he does mm -hmm. own a victory over Bilal. So, uh, yeah. I mean, he, it's not like he's taken many easy fights, and I think he's definitely earned this main event opportunity against Thompson. Uh, I will yeah. go with you, though. I agree, Thompson. I think is a little too quick for him. I think he's a little too technical and a little too savvy. I think uh, mm -hmm. I will agree with you. I think Thompson takes a unanimous decision here. Yeah, yeah it's, right. a, it's a big step up. It's a big step up in competition for him. You know, so that that and the, and the fact that he is a main event that that can play a big factor in it too. Sure, yeah, I, I agree with that too, and I know it's been a minute since Thompson fought too, so maybe we'll have two guys shaking off the rust at the same time. So yeah, yeah. All right, Phil. Well, we really really appreciate you coming on. A lot of interesting stuff. Before I let you go, though, I, this is my time to let you whore yourself out. Where can we find you? Plug yourself. Do whatever you got to do. Yeah, uh, I have my website, DeRoostrong.com. Check me out on Twitter, at DeRoostrong. And also on my Instagram, I put a lot of videos out of the fighters uh, training with me too as well. It's at DeRoostrong. So everything's DeRoostrong. Perfect. So everyone will check that out. Again, uh, does, does that website and all these things, do they have the uh, fitness and the uh, gym tips as yep. well? Perfect. Yeah, yep, programs, everything on there. So 
Awesome. So everyone check that out. I'm sure it's good stuff as we've heard on the show today. So uh, I will quickly plug myself, head over to Combat Press, MMA Intel, uh, Loudmouth MMA Podcast Network, all the stuff. You guys hear it every week. Uh, all these shows, everything's posted on my YouTube page. It's on my Twitter page, Facebook, etc. cetera. Uh, and that's enough horn out for me today. So uh, Phil, thank you again for coming on the show. It was really interesting. So for Phil Daru, my name is Riley Contic saying continue watching the fights, continue watching this show, and go fuck yourselves. Good night. 